here it looks like so good <clears throat> all right well hello everyone and welcome to the new year happy new year as dr forbes just said to everyone um, we're excited to kick off to 2023 and the online JBS Journal Club. Um, I'm going to share my screen and bring up my uh, the stuff for tonight. Um, let's see, that started at the end, so we'll go back. But tonight we have um, two exceptional articles. Again, for those of you that are fairly new to this, we choose two articles from the current um, JVS publications, and we talk about those and we have the authors and we have them presented by host institutions. Our host institutions this, um, this evening are the University of Alabama and the University of California, Davis. We're going to be discussing two articles, the variability of antiplatelet response in patients with peripheral artery disease, and also excellent results seen with both transaxillary and infraclavicular approaches to first ribosection in patients with subclavian vein thrombosis. From UAB, our uh, faculty presenter is Dr. Benjamin Pierce, who is an associate professor and the program director there, and then Dr. Claire Model, who is a second year integrated resident. From UC Davis, the faculty member that will be introducing uh, transax the paper on, on uh, th thoracic outlet syndrome is Dr. Mimi Kwong. She is an assistant professor of sur surgery. And Dr. Kat Delosa, who is a PGY4 resident. We're thrilled to have authors from both papers that will be here to answer questions and help us understand their research as well as delve into um, new things that are coming from that research. Um, the TOS paper, the senior author is Dr. Julie Freischlag. Um, also on that paper is Dr. Gabrielle, Gabriela Velasquez, who is here, and Lydia Farber, who is a first-year medical student, who's also um, on that, that paper. From uh, Mass General, Dr. Anahita Dua, who is an associate professor of surgery, and uh, her research fellow, Dr. Monica Mujandar, will be talking about or, or answering questions from their work. We have two great editorial board guests who will be moderating and leading that discussion. Dr. John Eit, um, Chief of Vascular at Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital in Dallas. And then Dr. Um, Lou Schwartz, who is a cl clinical professor of surgery at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital. Just a few little housekeeping items, please stay muted. We will encourage you to put your questions and comments in the chat for the moderator to address with the authors. If your question is a little confusing, we may ask you to unmute so that you can ask your question. The event is being recorded for on-demand access. And then of course, the February JVS Online Journal Club is going to be February 15th at 7 p.m. And that is gonna be hosted by the MedStar Washington Hospital, Dr. Crystal uh, Maloney, and also by Palma Shaw from SUNY Upstate. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to our first faculty member. Thanks a lot, Misty. Um, I'm gonna pull up, um, if you guys can't see it, somebody stop me, otherwise we're gonna plow right in. So this paper talks about platelet resistance in patients with uh, PAD. And I think this is a really great topic for us to understand. You know, like a lot of things in vascular surgery, there's no real con clear consensus on antithrombotic therapy, but it's so critical for our patients, right? It's an issue for things like primary prevention, secondary prevention, and post-intervention patency. And why is it that this is something that's difficult for us all to come by? Well, you know, clotting is a pretty complex thing. And, you you know, back in the day, I probably could recite this for you when I had to, but now that I'm, you know, 15 years out of fellowship, this is kind of what you think about when you think about clotting. And so it's a really difficult process, and there's a lots of places you can target it. But what do we know about this? Well, we do know that there is quite frequently resistance documented to, to various antiplatelet therapies. The G23B inhibitors are pro-drugs. They have to actually be activated in hepatic circulation and thus are susceptible to things that alter the cytokrine P450 system, as we all know. And there's also a genetic inheritance to, of resistance to Plavix, although that's relatively infrequent. Aspirin has multiple levels that it can fail at because of the complex pathway that it works as well in plate inhibition. The big deal right for our patients when you're talking about intervention is that the lack of pharmacologic effect of antibiotic therapy is probably tied to therapeutic outcome, but not always. Um, and that's something we can get in, we'll get into with this paper. 
Uh, and the other thing that can cloud our antiplatelet therapy is maybe there are things we could be doing better, such as the most recent data that we see on direct factor 10 inhibitors and their influence on PAD patients. But overall, this has to affect our management of patients and our role as vascular surgeons, because we do more than just surgery, right? That's a big part of the SVS push. It's a big part of who we are. And so we need to understand antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation for all the various things I mentioned. We need to understand how to evaluate a patient and understand their risk of thrombosis versus the risk of what we are prescribing and doing to them, including the pharmacologic factors with each agent, the patient level factors and risk for bleeding. And then of course, the risk of the vascular bed at risk, right? We, we're much more sensitive to things like carotid stents maybe than we are to SFA stenting. And the appropriate evaluation of, this, of all these effects can influence the decisions we give to our patients. And so with that, I'd like to turn the, the, the screen over to Claire, who's gonna talk about this really great paper looking at how we can assess uh, platelet function in our patients. All right. Um, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Peters, for the introduction, and thank you to the Journal Club for the opportunity to present today. Um, we will be talking about variability of antiplatelet response in patients with peripheral artery disease, um, and thank you so much to Dr. Majumda and Dr. Uh, Dua for joining us. So antiplatelet therapy is the foundation of pharmacologic management for cardiovascular disease. Um, unfortunately, up to 65% of patients will exhibit resistance, non-responsiveness, or failure of therapy to aspirin or Plavix. Under or over treatment poses a dual high risks of thrombotic or hemorrhagic complications, suggesting an obvious advantage to individualized objective treatment strategies. To date, no point of care testing to determine antiplatelet efficacy has been incorporated into current treatment guidelines. A tag with platelet mapping provides an objective analysis of clot strengthening and platelet fibrin interactions and maybe one point of care technology that can serve to guide individualized treatment. The image at the bottom of the screen shows the tag for clot strength in three individual patients. It demonstrates wide variability between total clot strength, represented by the red line, and net clot strength after platelet inhibition, represented by the blue line. The platelet assay provides a qualitative function of platelet function. Three different reagents are used to generate measures of best platelet reactivity and clot formation, represented by the gray line, clot formation in the presence of antiplatelet therapy, represented by the blue line, and clot formation with 0% platelet contribution, represented by the red line. The hypothesis at the foundation of this paper is that quantifying the antiplatelet response in individual patients may be beneficial in maintaining normal clotting physiology in patients with PAD. The objectives were to one, establish a range of platelet response to antiplatelet agents in patients with PAD, and two, to identify differences in platelet reactivity in response to these antiplatelet treatment regimens. The authors conducted a single institution prospective study of 143 patients undergoing lower extremity revascularization over the time period December 2020 to April 2022. Patients underwent open endovascular and hybrid procedures, and all patients received preoperative antiplatelet therapy, defined as aspirin within seven days of the platelet mapping blood draw or Plavix within 48 hours of the platelet mapping blood draw. Blood samples were collected preoperatively within 24 hours perioperatively, inpatient for up to five days, and outpatient at one, three, and six months. The study included 521 total samples from 143 patients. There were 360 samples in the antiplatelet monotherapy group and 161 samples in the dual antiplatelet therapy group. The monotherapy regimens evalu evaluated were aspirin 81 milligrams and 325 milligrams and Plavix 75 milligrams. Dual antiplatelet therapy regimens were Plavix 75 milligrams with aspirin 81 or 325 milligrams. Within antiplatelet regimen subgroups, differences in platelet inhibition were stratified by comorbid and clinical characteristics. Samples were evaluated over four clinical phases, the preoperative phase, postoperative inpatient, postoperative outpatient, and overall. Patients receiving antiplatelet loading doses were also evaluated in a sub-analysis. The majority of the study population were non-Hispanic white males. Common comorbid conditions included hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and smoking. 38% of patients underwent open procedures, 44% underwent endovascular procedures, and 17% underwent hybrid procedures. Quartile analysis of percent platelet inhibition by antiplatelet regimen demonstrated wide variability overall. A large number of patients, including patients on dual antiplatelet therapy, fell into the zero to 30% platelet inhibition range to the left side of the screen, while a smaller percentage fell into the 70 to 100% inhibition range, including some on antiplatelet monotherapy. The median percent platelet inhibition was 20.2% 20, 20 for monotherapy compared to 29% for dual therapy. 
Within monotherapy regimens, there was no significant difference between aspirin 81 milligrams and aspirin 325 milligrams. Plavix performed, outperformed either aspirin dosage with a mean platelet inhibition of 44.8% compared to 24 to 27% for aspirin monotherapy. And this difference was statistically significant. Plavix also demonstrated the largest variability in effect as demonstrated by the burnt orange box and whisker plot to the right side of the figure. Analysis of variance yielded an F ratio of 9.8 supporting these between group differences. There was no difference in platelet inhibition when Plavix was combined with aspirin 81 milligrams versus 325 milligrams. Looking at the effect of drug loading, 21 patients received Plavix 300 milligrams prior to intervention and one patient received Plavix 150 milligrams prior to intervention. All preoperative samples were taken prior to antiplatelet loading, therefore postoperative day one data was used to assess effects of drug loading. There was no significant difference in platelet inhibition in patients who received loading doses of Plavix and those who did not on post up day one, regardless of whether patients were on mono or dual antiplatelet therapy. Compared to monotherapy, dual antiplatelet therapy resulted in greater platelet inhibition overall and greater platelet inhibition during the preoperative and postoperative outpatient phases. There was no significant difference between mono and dual antiplatelet therapy in the postoperative inpatient phase. When looking at platelet aggregation, there were again significant differences between mono and dual antiplatelet therapy overall and within the preoperative and postoperative outpatient phases. Looking next at platelet inhibition stratified by clinical characteristics, history of smoking was associated with higher platelet inhibition compared to non-smokers in the antiplatelet monotherapy group. Mean platelet inhibition was 33% in smokers compared to 23% in non-smokers. This difference was also seen in the dual antiplatelet therapy data with smokers having 42% platelet inhibition compared to 23% platelet inhibition in non-smokers. Additional differences seen in the dual antiplatelet therapy group included lower platelet inhibition in patients with diabetes and a trend towards um, lower platelet inhibition in patients undergoing endovascular interventions compared to those undergoing other types of interventions. In conclusion, this study is a real-world analysis of the variation in response to antiplatelet therapy after lower extremity revascularization. It demonstrates a wide range of therapeutic benefit with mono or dual antiplatelet therapy. The results of the antiplatelet monotherapy analysis demonstrate the greatest mean platelet inhibition, but also the most variability in platelet inhibition for Plavix, as can be seen in the box and whisker plot to the right hand side of the screen. This suggests an advantage to point of care tag platelet mapping to assess individual response to antiplatelet therapy, as other tests for Plavix non-responsiveness, such as CYP2C19 gene testing, may only explain up to 12% of the reported response variability. There was no significant effect of Plavix loading dose on post-op day one, and overall, dual antiplatelet therapy was superior to monotherapy in terms of platelet inhibition and platelet aggregation reduction. This difference was seen overall and in the preoperative and postoperative outpatient phases. Future directions for this work include furthering, uh, sorry, assessing individual response to treatment with DOAC or DOAC and a single antiplatelet agent, furthering our understanding of the driving factors behind this individual response variability, defining the duration of platelet inhibition after the last dose or drug discontinuation, and providing clinical correlation for the TEG platelet mapping analysis metrics such as graft or stent failure. This will be important in determining how this paper's findings with regard to platelet inhibition are or are not linked to clinical outcomes. Our takeaways from this paper with regard to clinical practice are as follows. First, it is more consistent to use dual antiplatelet therapy rather than monotherapy given the variability in effect among monotherapy regimens. Second, loading doses of Plavix are probably not necessary in patients on dual antiplatelet therapy. Third, TEG with platelet mapping is a great idea, especially if you have patients at high risk for thrombosis, such as those getting carotid or missing enteric stents. And second, and this is perhaps more a question for the discussion, um, would we have to reincorporate this information on variability to antiplatelet agents into our antithrombotic regimens overall? So that's all I have. Um, thank you for your time, and I'll now open up the forum for discussion and any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ait. You have this one? No, you have the other one, sorry. Yes, uh, Missy, I think, uh, I think, yes. Yeah, okay. So my name is Lou Schwartz and uh, thanks very much for the kind invitation to attend. Thanks, Misty and Paul for uh, putting this together. This is a fascinating uh, study. I understand we have some uh, MGH authors, uh, right, uh, uh, of the study. Uh, that have joined us. And first of all, thanks very much, Dr. 
uh, model for your uh, presentation. Obviously, much more clever than your boss, although that's really not such a high mark. You know, this is a great uh, study from the uh, MGH group, like so many um, great uh, papers of, uh, and uh, <clears throat> investigations by this group. It really does rearrange our thinking uh, regarding how we uh, treat patients with vascular disease. Uh, and uh, also typical of the group offers little in the way of solutions. I have several uh, questions. Uh, number one, um, <clears throat> does the thromboelastogram really predict um, percent platelet inhibition, inhibition? Is that, is that, is that with, with a high correlation? Um, the, uh, there's a lot of information on thromboelastogram and there's many different uh, drugs, anticoagulants uh, that affect it. Uh, your endpoint, the endpoint in the paper is percent platelet inhibition. Can that be accurately read from the thromboelastogram? Wow, that's a great question. And <clears throat> before I answer, my name is uh, Anaita Dua. I'm one of the uh, vascular surgeons at Mass General. We're so honored to be invited to speak today. Um, Dr. Majumdar, who's um, going to be speaking the majority of the time, um, was my postdoc last year, is currently applying for a vascular surgery fellowship. So I must say that plug and is going to be number one. So <laughs> just want to make sure that I give her her props because she really um, was the one who kind of made this discovery. Um, so to start with, not the conventional TEG is my answer to Dr. Schwartz. So when we think of TEG and the way TEG is used currently in practice in all of our institutions, usually you think of trauma, you think of organ transplant, you think of CT surgery, you're thinking of bleeding and using TEG to, uh, sorry, my dog is next to me, um, using TEG to uh, decipher what um, uh, parts of the whole blood breakdown you should give a patient to get them to clot. But TAG was actually invented in the 1940s, 50s for clotting, not for bleeding. But what happened in the military is essentially the use of TAG to determine what types of um, uh, whole blood components should be given to a patient to allow them to start to clot is what drove it to the forefront and, of course, clinical practice. But TAG cartridges that um, are used currently can be used with something called platelet mapping, so TAG PM, and that platelet mapping cartridge is what gives you actually a beautiful breakdown. So it's not even deciphered from a number of, you know, different equations and numbers, and then you deduce. It's actually the right in front of you platelet integration, platelet aggregation, and they are two sides of the same coin in that they add up to 100. So, you know, if you're aggregated 30%, you're inhibited um, 70%. That's what it's supposed to be. There's always a little bit here and there. Um, but in order to make any impact, it doesn't matter, you know, just what the number is. If I put a stent in you and I do your, your peg and I find out, hey, um, on aspirin and Plavix, Dr. Schwartz is, you know, 12% inhibited. So what? What's the clinical implication of that? And that actually is what our lab was overall working on when we kind of did this sub-project. And that manuscript actually just got published in the JAHA, finding that the cut point to basically prevent thrombosis is 30%. So 30% of your platelets need to be inhibited for you to have a benefit from a thrombotic. Now that's gonna be fine tuned, of course. And you know, what's the upper limit of that? I could inhibit 100% of your platelets, you won't clot, but then you'll bleed to death. So there is a range, of course, um, which is what we're working on. But um, what we found is, and that's the whole point of the variability paper, is such extreme variation. So you may think you're treating your patient right, DAPT, aspirin platics, but the fact of the matter is you're not because one patient may be reacting 12% of their platelets are doing the right thing, but in another patient, you're at 50%, and that's really the person getting treated appropriately. And another manuscript that kind of was an offshoot of this is looking at males and females. We found that women essentially do not respond the same way to antiplatelet medication as men. So we're essentially under-treating all of our female patients, which is why even with lower comorbidities, and less likelihood of smoking and other factors, women do worse in that they get amputated more and their wounds don't heal more. And this might be the physiologic reason why we're not treating them right. But um, go ahead, please. Well, I, thank you for that uh, uh, answer. And it, it actually, um, you also discussed my next question. I was going to reference your figure two, the histogram, and ask, you know, what is the optimate, optimal amount of uh, percent platelet inhibition for a patient undergoing vascular intervention, and you think it's around 30%. So let me, let me ask you, in general, I, you know, for those of us, uh, most of us who don't routinely use this test, what antiplatelet regimen, you know, it, I know there's quite a lot of variability, and that's the point of the paper, but what antiplatelet platelet regimen in general will yield 30% platelet inhibition? 
So, hi, Dr. Schwartz. So I'm Monica. Thank you so much for the question. And thank you so much for having us be here. You know, that's, that's the biggest question. So what is the regimen? And I think the problem thus far that we've had in trying to figure this out is using some sort of generalized approach. And my answer to you is it depends. It depends on the patient and it depends on what their platelet mapping shows. So you know, the whole goal of this first study was to be very observational and just see, hey, what are we dealing with? And we expected some variability, but we were quite surprised at this, you know, huge range in both mono antiplatelet and dual antiplatelet. And so what that's telling me is that, you know, maybe for you, aspirin alone is okay, but, you know, maybe for, you know, my patient next door, they're going to need aspirin and Plavix isn't working at all. And they're going to need to Cagrelor. So our next big step is really looking at um, TAG with medication management and trying to guide therapy based on those cut points that we found to see, hey, can we add, you know, regimens in and enhance regimens to get to that goal of, you know, at least 30% inhibition. But I truly think that we are potentially going to a world that looks a little more like diabetes management. You know, if you were to ask, hey, what's the best way to keep a hemoglobin A1C down below six, there would be a lot of answers for a lot of different patients from a lot of different endocrinologists. And I think there's a potential that we're sort of missing the boat here in the peripheral arterial disease and the arterial thrombotic disease world um, in asking, you know, what's the one regimen instead of what's going on with the patient. Well, I can accept that. Uh, nonetheless, we're, you know, we do need to practice uh, with imperfect information. So I'm going to ask you uh, both a question and I'm also going to ask her, Dr. Pierce to chime in, uh, and that is referencing your figure three, uh, which is a, a, a very provocative, very provocative bar graph in which uh, no difference is shown between the two doses of aspirin. Um, quite a shock uh, for all of us who have, you know, tried to think about uh, this problem and tried to assimilate data. You know, every single clinic, there's at least two or three patients that are asking the question, Granted, they're not all undergoing intervention, but are asking the question, which dose of aspirin should I be taking and why? Uh, and I really hate to give them the answer of it doesn't matter. So I'm going to ask both of you in patients, let's say, that are not undergoing intervention, but are patients that are asking you that question in your clinic, uh, which dose do you recommend and why? And then I'll ask Dr. Pierce the same. Let, may I, <clears throat> let me take that one and tell you uh, two different stories. So first of all, it is unfortunate, but it doesn't matter. And not only did I see that here when we did this uh, study, but also ba back, I mean, not that far ago, but in 2014, when I was a postdoctoral research fellow, um, I was in a lab with two PhDs that were doing uh, coagulation studies. I was obviously an MD and we were doing our postdocs together. And this question that came up as, at that time as well, that's kind of what stimulated all this and obviously why I brought this forward. And at that time also, we took blood of each other on those medications, just kind of messing around, we never published it or anything, and it didn't matter. And so what we were, I mean, I, I don't have any real reason why things are the way they are, but it seems like it's just tribalism. In the CT surgery world, they use 325, we use 81, that's really the end of it. And it doesn't make, but, but you know, that brings up another important point. In this game of platelets and you know, antithrombotics, there's the drug, there's the dose, and there's the reaction of the patient. And all these things come together to make you know, an answer. What, what's that person going to do at that time? And also, there's what the patient's doing. So for example, if a patient may be just fine on aspirin and Plavix, making that 30 cut point, but then they get COVID. And maybe for that three weeks, they've got COVID. Hey, you need to be covered with Eliquis. I don't know. Wouldn't it be great to have a point of clear test that tells you, you know what, this person needs to have this much extra to hit this cut point at this time. And, but one of the things that we originally were focused on was the dosing. And we saw very early on, it didn't seem to make that much of a difference. So we dropped it as part of our regimen and just said, we're just gonna keep, I mean, everyone, most of our patients are on 81 anyway. We're just gonna look at this. But of course, when we have enough data, we wanna to compare to see if there's a difference. And we, um, we didn't. And um, just to answer Dr. Eit's question, which was very important um, earlier, the, the one, this one, of course, and uh, um, one prior, he had asked if tag platelet mapping <clears throat> is the best way to look at platelets. It's not. 
light agonometry is the best way, but it's not in clinical practice. The only FDA approved way that you can look at platelets and immediately implement something is through tag platelet mapping. All the other better gold standard tests are all under research. So yes, if I was just doing this for research only and wanting the best numbers, that's the way to do it. But if you want it to be translational and quick, this is the one thing that's on the market and everyone's got tag machines in their offices. All you need to do is buy the platelet cartridge, which is why we went with this. Um, and are, you, are you using this routinely clinically? No, no, because right now it's still research. Actually, um, we, uh, Sawanika and I are just working on an R01 that's going in next week for this deadline to look, do an RCT using this cut point. And once that happens, then we'll potentially be able to use it clinically. What we're doing right now is an interventional observational study, essentially, which I know sounds contradictory, but what we're really doing is we don't have a control arm, but we're taking patients who come in for a um, endovascular therapy at this time. We check their tag. If they hit over 30 and they're on aspirin alone, we leave them alone. If they don't make the 30% cut point, which they usually don't on aspirin alone, we add Plavix and we check them in seven days. If they hit the 30 cut point, we leave them alone. If they don't, we send them for Plavix resistance testing and replace Plavix with Berlinta. So, and then we're following them to see if compared to our historical cohort, which is what you're seeing in the studies we've already published, do we drop thrombotic rates by 50%, which is what we are hypothesizing. Well, I, I commend you for applying all the science to your clinical practice. Sounds like a lot of work. Dr. Pierce, what do you tell so patients cool. when they ask you of whether or not they should be taking 81 or 325 milligrams of aspirin. Granted, what? they're all in Alabama, so they probably should be taking 325, but what do you tell them? <laughs> Roll tide. Um, so, so <laughs> we, uh, you know, I, I think that, that it's pretty well established that the antiplatelet effect of 81 versus 325 is not that much different, but the GI literature and the GI doctors certainly think that the, the side effect, the other side effects of aspirin on things like peptic ulcer disease are clearly dose dependent. And so I, I don't aggressively take patients beyond baby aspirin, regardless of the disease process. And I guess the other just important point to make maybe for the younger folks is, is these patients that we're recommending aspirin to without intervention are ones who have documented vascular disease in some bed, asymptomatic carotid plaque, asymptomatic stenosis, uh, claudication with, with abnormal ABI. It's pretty well established now that just giving people aspirin because they're 50 doesn't work because there are side effects like bleeding and like peptic ulcer disease and exacerbation of asthma and those sorts of things. And again, like I said, most of those other adverse effects are dose dependent. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty adamant about baby aspirin. Let me ask you this, Ben, you know, um, uh, all of my patients that I'm going to operate on or, or do intervention on are on aspirin. And I have taken to uh, lo doing every procedure on Plavix, lo loading them all on Plavix, regardless of whether it's open uh, or percutaneous. Uh, what's your standard antiplatelet regimen for a patient undergoing vascular intervention in Alabama? 100%. All carotid patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy, including Plavix or, or Berlenta pre-op. I, in fact, will cancel the case now, even for a carotid nerdorectomy, not just for TCAR. I think we, we, have to, we have to pay attention to, the, to what's come from the patients who get carotid interventions and that aren't on dual antiplatelet therapy because it's just such a high risk vascular thing. In the leg cases, I'm not that worried about bleeding. So I'll leave them on that, but I'll be honest, I'll put a plug in for the Voyager trial. My leg cases, I've become much more aggressive about doing 81 aspirin in, in rivaroxaban on the patients that can afford it. Because I, I can tell you that there was a lot of anecdotal evidence, including out of Dr. Schwartz's lab when I was a resident about, about patency of lower extremity bypasses, including prosthetic grafts and, and Coumadin, and it never really panned out, but I really do find that I think that the data on that on that study is really good for lower extreme intervention, and so I probably have switched over more to that, but for carotids, um, I, I stick with the with dual antiplatelet therapy 100%. Yep, I'm the same. Listen, the discussion has been rich, really quite a, a provocative uh, paper. I congratulate the, the authors for this. I'm very excited about their ongoing work. It's 731. Misty, I'll turn the program back to you. Thank you, thank you. And for um, for Dr. Dua and also for Dr. Um, Majumdar, there are some questions in the chat if you do wanna to try to, to answer them as we move forward. But at this point, we are going to move to our second paper. And Dr. Kwong, I think you're gonna start our introduction. Yes, sorry, I am. Um... Got a call from my mom right as I was about to start. So, um, 
I figured you oh, were just nice. adding more questions to the chat because I know you're excited about platelets and aggregation. So, yes, I'm geeking out, but I'm a slight shift in topic. Um, and so I'm Mimi Kwong. I'm one of the junior faculty um, at UC Davis Medical Center under my boss, uh, Dr. Humphreys. Um, so I will. I have the distinct pleasure of presenting um, or at least introducing this article. Um, uh, coming out of Wake Forest uh, from uh, Ms. Faber and her mentors, Dr. Freischlag and Dr. Velasquez. And so I'll try to do this background some justice. I apologize, Dr. Freischlag, um, my prior mentor, if I make any mistakes. But um, Venus TOS is the second most common presentation of thoracic outlet syndrome, um, second only to neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. And it accounts for about 9% of TOS cases. Um, it's thought to be due, it's usually seen in patients uh, age 20 to 40 years old, and it's thought to be due to uh, repetitive upper extremity movements. A textbook example that we always hear about are pitchers or swimmers who have a lot of these overhead movements. Um, and these movements result in, uh, in hypertrophy of the subclavius muscle or the costoclavicular ligament, um, which then narrows the costoclavicular space. Um, the borders of this, if we all remember from, um, from medical school, is the first rib inferiorly costoclavicular ligament medially, the, clavic the clavicle and the subclavius muscle slash tendon superiorly, and then the anterior scalene muscle laterally. And so um, hypertrophy of these then cause some compression of that subclavian vein. And just to kind of give everyone a, a quick overview of the anatomy, you can see here um, that's that medial most aspect muscle that you see there is a subclavius muscle. And then kind of just deep to that, um, you'll see the uh, costoclavicular ligament. And so you can see how the hypertrophy of these two can uh, result in kind of compression of the uh, subclavian vein between the two bony structures anterior and the anterior scalene. And so um, patients who, uh, de who develop venous TOS present with pain, edema, paresthesias, um, as well as cyanosis. Um, in, in when these symptoms come and go, uh, we call this McCleary syndrome, which is intermittent compression. Um, when you develop thrombosis of the subclavian vein, um, this becomes paget shorter syndrome, uh, which is venous occlusion. And so, um, when uh, when we think about treatment, typically when these patients present acutely, um, they undergo catheter-directed thrombolysis. And you can see here kind of is an example of that where you see occlusion of the subclavian vein and then after thrombolysis, um, there is now patent flow to the subclavian vein with loss of a lot of these collaterals. Um, uh, studies show, unfortunately, that without, uh, sorry, it's, uh, what we know is that after these patients undergo their thrombolysis, um, their symptoms are often much better, but studies show that the recurrence risk is very high. Douglas, stop. Um, my dog is bothering me now. Um, recurrent risk is high with 20 to 30% of patients developing um, rethrombosis if the compression is not relieved. Um, and so uh, typically there's, we consider that, that the catheter-directed thrombolysis is, um, is only kind of the first step of the therapy and really the definitive treatment is first a resection with anterior scalenectomy. Um, often this is then followed by repeat venography, um, either immediately or delayed with treatment of any kind of persistent stenosis um, or thrombosis. And so the approach though to this definitive therapy, the first root resection and anterior scalenectomy, it remains uh, somewhat hotly debated. Um, there is uh, the supraclavicular approach, which I won't uh, go through too much detail here because it's not, it, it was not one of the approaches that we, that was studied in this. Um, and then we also have an infraclavicular approach, which essentially you kind of come from under the clavicle, but above um, the vein. And um, th as you can see kind of in this, in these, this um, image over here on the right, what you do is you resect, you um, uh, disconnect the first rib from the sternum, um, pull the rib anteriorly, cut the, um, the anterior scalene muscle, cut the posterior, the, as posterior as you can on the rib and kind of remove the rib from there. Um, and so you, as you can imagine, this allows really great decompression of the, um, the uh, that costoclavicular space, particularly anteriorly, but you end up leaving quite a bit of rib. And so um, what, we, what we know is that um, in these patients, you get this excellent exposure, you can reconstruct the vein, you can really decompress the vein anteriorly, but there's not, you, you with the incomplete rib resection, these patients are um, at risk for potential uh, then development of um, neurogenic thoracic outlet from that persistent rib. Um, in the transaxillary approach, um, it's 
it provides excellent exposure of the first rib. And so you can really more completely resect the first rib um, from this approach. But as you can kind of see that you're not able to get quite as quite a, you aren't able to get much exposure of this the in terms of length of the subclavian vein and also it's quite deep um, and so reconstruction of the vein from this approach is essentially impossible um, and the other thing is if you're planning on doing a, veno a venogram with intervention during the same procedure you would have to kind of move the patients because these patients are typically in a, a decubitus position and so um, as such we're not completely sure what which of these approaches is better. And so um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Faber and, and her colleagues at Wake Forest sought to compare the, the best post-operative, or sorry, the, compare the post-operative outcomes for these two approaches, uh, transaxillary first rib resection with delayed venography versus infraclavicular first rib resection um, and subclavius muscle resection with um, uh, committant uh, venography. And so I'll um, kind of shift our attention over to um, Dr. DeLosa, who will go over um, this study. So as Dr. Kwong mentioned, I'll be taking over the discussion at this point. Um, as she discussed, the focus was on patients with venous TOS, and specifically, they were looking at um, those with subclavian vein occlusion at the time of diagnosis. So the authors completed a retrospective cohort review to compare the efficacy and outcomes of first rib resection and scalenectomy by a transaxillary approach with delayed venography or an infraclavicular infra approach with concomitant venography. Their data was obtained from a single institutional cohort that identified all patients undergoing first rib resection with uh, scalenectomy for TOS. And then patients uh, were included in the analysis if they had identified venous TOS as well as subclavian vein thrombosis by duplex, and they were undergoing an intervention um, for rib resection and uh, subsequent venography or concomitant venography. Specific outcomes included any complications and post-procedure subclavian vein patency. So of 73 patients who were in their uh, initial cohort institutionally, they identified 36 patients that met their inclusion criteria. Patients were included in the transaxillary group and the infraclavicular group. No significant differences were in gender or age between the two groups. Uh, they did notice whenever looking at the rates of thrombolysis between the two groups that only 27% of transaxillary approach patients had Thrombolysis, uh, thrombolysis preoperatively versus 70% in the infraclavicular group. And while the mean uh, time interval between vein thrombosis and intervention was 2.3 all patients, they noted that um, at the time of intervention, 10 um, patent veins uh, roughly had a month uh, uh, time interval versus six months in stenotic, four months in occluded veins. And the transaxillary patients with delayed venography, authors noted that whenever they were completing uh, venography, that 15 patients had stenotic subclavian veins, one had an acutely thrombosed vein, three were chronically occluded, and eight remained peak. With regard to their complications, they noted that they had a 19% rate of uh, chest tubes required in patients that had a transaxillary approach, which was a total of seven patients. And in the infraclavicular uh, approach, they noted one hematoma, a wound infection, and the hemothorax. Um, they noted that the infra, uh, infraclavicular patients had a longer average length of stay at two days compared to the one-day stay for the future. And uh, infra, infraclavicular patients had a longer mean follow-up length, so about 15.8 months versus 10.4 in the transaxillary group. And there was no significant difference in subclavian vein patency during follow-up. And looking at their discussion, they discussed a lot of the things that Dr. Kwong, Kwong mentioned in her introduction. Uh, they noted some of the benefits of the transaxillary approach, including decreased operative time with nice experience of the rib, the vessels, and the nerves with reduced scarring, visible scarring, uh, blood loss, and post-operative shoulder disability. Uh, the issues described with this approach in the literature before have been the inability to perform concomitant venography, as Dr. Kwong mentioned, or vein reconstruction of the index operation. Some also, also some concerns about incomplete rib removal and ultimate failure of the intervention. 
Conversely, some of the advantage, advantages of the infraclavicular approach included you to uh, do the concomitant venography as well as vein reconstruction if required in the index procedure with better anterior rib visualization. Though it is also associated with increased visible scarring as well as shoulder disability in a longer operative time. The authors also highlighted that more recent literature has demonstrated excellent primary and secondary support in vein patency with venoplasty, um, a less invasive, uh, invasive approach. They noted that this finding was reaffirmed in their current study with a 93% and 100% patency in the transaxillary and infraclavicular approaches. In addition to the excellent outcomes from surgical interventions, uh, vein patency anticoagulation practice. Uh, specifically, they noted that they did three to six months of anticoagulation with uh, either DOAC or warfarin if there was residual thrombus present on venogram following venoplasty. An additional month for residual stenosis or one to two months for residual uh, Limitations of the study included the retrospective nature in the small cohort with a limited number of infraclavicular cases for comparison. In conclusion, the authors noted that both the transaxillary and the infraclavicular exposures offered excellent outcomes for venous TOS with associated vein thrombosis with few complications and no mortalities. With this in mind, the authors recommended choosing an exposure familiar to the surgeon, as both surgical approaches provide excellent subclavian vein patency and resolution of symptoms during follow-up. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Dr. Eit, you ready? Yeah, I'd love to talk about this. Uh, of all the topics in vascular surgery, this is one of those that uh, have come to know absolutely no good answers for. I thought when I finished fellowship, I knew how to treat these patients. And after listening to Dr. Jo uh, Freischlag over the years and my partner, Greg Pearl and Kai Johansson and other people, I'm convinced that it's, it's a challenging area that's hard to get a real answer. I did want to ask Lydia one question that, that uh, I think was fair was when you were going, you were, I suspect that you did a lot of the real groundwork on this. How did you figure out whether these uh, veins were actually patent in long-term follow-up? Was that by venography, ultrasound, or clinical symptoms? Yeah. So in long-term follow-up, um, the patients monitored over post-surgery. I also noted there was a similar question in the chat. All patients who had transaxillary operations did have a venogram two weeks post-operation. Yeah. Um, so monitoring that in the chart, um, upon venogram, it was noted whether, whether the, the vein was patent or stenotic or chronically occluded. Mm -hmm. And based on that, if the vein was patent, the patients were immediately taken off their anti anticoagulations. If not, I monitored for how long they were on anticoagulation um, until the vein opened up. Uh, opened up by ultrasound, I assume. Yes. And then each visit they came in, they were confirmed by duplex ultrasound. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I know it's a challenge to when you haven't really seen these kind of operations to do these chart reviews. And I want to congratulate you for doing a great job. Um, I had another clarification question, maybe Dr. Kwong could answer, and it had to do with the duration of symptoms in the two groups prior to first rib resection. My impression is, partly because of Dr. Freischlag's reputation for good results with this, that some of her patients are referred with, uh, from farther away, and I suspect that some of the patients in the infraclavicular group may have been more of the, the local people that uh, had shorter duration symptoms. Do you have any idea whether the duration of symptoms, that is from the onset of symptoms at the time of first river section, would have been longer in the uh, transaxillary group? Let's see who's out there. Is Dr. Kwong? Yeah, I can help answer that. Or Gabby, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can help answer that. I know, you know, interestingly, what you say is actually, uh, it's all what Dr. Freshlight taught us when she came to Wake Forest, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like, like you said, you know, you are, you get comfortable with one kind of way of doing an operation and, uh, you know, where you train in fellowship and that's what you learn. And then honestly, we were fortunate enough to have Dr. Fresh like come our way and she taught us how to do this transaxillary approach that basically none of us had 
you know, learn about it much. We were doing infraclavicular, infraclavicular um, approach uh, by one of our partners, Dr. Geary was doing it then. And that's, you know, how we kind of were doing things. And one thing that you will see different too in the difference of those approaches is that those where we're getting infraclavicular approach, we're getting more thrombolysis, which Dr. Fraser, like I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but she right. does not believe that that's absolutely necessary in most cases. So. I think part of the trend is that, to be honest, and, uh, and and sort of like the pattern of referral and so forth. But it's really more about, you know, again, how comfortable you are with specific kind of operation and how you're going to treat them. Yeah, thank you. And well, Julie, we might as well get to you and give you the floor. So uh, <laughs> I did want to ask you about what fraction of the patients do you think have concomitant neurologic symptoms uh, that really does speak against the infraclavicular approach? Because it is hard to get the back of that rib out if you don't do a supraclavicular incision simultaneously, sort of paraclavicular for uh, neurologic symptoms. So uh, it, 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 you feel like the transaxillary does a better job to get complete decompression of the uh, brachial plexus. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate being here tonight. I Sort of had a visiting professor, so I sort of zoomed in. Don't you love the fact you can just pop on to make this happen? Yeah. Um, so Lydia did all of this as a college student. So every year I get a Wake Forest University college student that shadows me for the year. And she actually presented this work at the Southern Association of Vascular Surgery. And actually, she's probably seen enough first row resections to do one, you know, because <laughs> uh, she actually came and scrubbed, uh, she couldn't scrub because it was illegal, but she was in the, the uh, and she's a first year medical student. And then Dr. Velasquez has just been a, a fabulous uh, partner of mine, as was uh, Dr. Humphreys to, to make that happen. So uh, Dr. Geary actually does great work with the infraclavicular approach and, right. and had done that when I got here. So we thought this was a great opportunity to compare two approaches because we had two people doing two approaches sort of at the same time, and you are right. He saw the ones that came acutely. He believes uh, fully in thrombolysis, and he was able to uh, do a, a very good rib resection as well as the venogram on the table where ours did come delayed. And, and many of you know that I'm not sure you need to do um, venolysis. I actually think that my practice, usually they come days, weeks, months, years after their thrombus that I'm not sure that that's an essential part. And as the CEO, I, you know, you cost me lots of money if you do that. So, so part of it is whether or not you actually need to do thrombolysis. And Randy and I don't agree without that, but I think the key to this disease is you gotta have a protocol you stick to. I just wrote a, um, a commentary on Dr. Thompson's approach to this disease. And, and I called it, uh, it's all about the rib or is it? Uh, you do need to take the rib out, but you do need to figure out what's going on in that vein. And, and when I initially started practice, we assumed the vein was open and it's not. So the three things you got to do is you got to take out that whole rib. And, and when we do the transaxillary approach, we tend to take out one little more piece posterior to make sure they don't get neurogenic later. And I think, John, probably maybe 10, 20 percent have neurogenic sure. symptoms uh, are a neurogenic people, about a third of them will have arterial symptoms. If you look at yeah. them, they'll be ischemic, about 10 to 20%. But you got to take that at that little bit of extra ribs. So when their arm goes down, that nerve doesn't hit bone. And I must yeah. admit in the last four months, I think I've done six residual ribs from people that mm -hmm. don't take out the whole ribs. So you got to take out the whole rib. And then you got to figure out if that vein's open. And you can do it at the time of surgery like Randy does, but they stay in the hospital longer. We bring them back at two weeks and look at it to make that happen. And then the third thing is you have to be pretty liberal with anticoagulation. You know, once you dilate it or if it's occluded, we've seen them open. Treating them two or three months with anticoagulation to maintain patency actually allows them to have these great patency rates. But you need a protocol, all rib, vein open, anticoagulation. And then we used to follow them for two years, but you can follow them for six months. If it's yeah. open at six months, 90% of them will stay open. I've had a couple reocclude. They've got cancer. It's a funny story to do it. But part of it is you really need to have a protocol that you do all the time. Rib out, vein open, anticoagulation. Julie, I wanted to ask you another question that has been a, a, a real vexing problem for me is perioperative management of anticoagulation. So whether you come in with 
uh, thrombolysis, uh, you get anticoagulated, and there's some time between that and the time you have the first rib out, let's say, some of your patients come in on anticoagulants, I assume. What do you do with anticoagulants? I've been burned both ways. I, I try not to stop the anticoagulants and I get a perioperative hematoma. If I stop the anticoagulants, they get perioperative thrombosis. By the time I get out of the room, the vein is rethrombosed. And then I'm trying to figure out, well, what do I do post-op? So what do you do with perioperative anticoagulation on somebody who is anticoagulant when they go to the OR or when they come to you? Right. And, and I don't um, really believe in thrombolysis. So many of my patients come in on anticoagulation. <clears throat> I think you can schedule the operation anytime you want. It can be weeks, it can be months. A lot of them are college kids, they have jobs. You sort of set it up that they have a month off to work with you to get their vein open. So what I do if they're on Eliquis or Xarelto, I stop it three days ahead of time and put them on Lovenox for those three days pre-op. And no Lovenox the day of surgery then I don't put them on any anticoagulation for three days after surgery. Cause I like you, John have done one major hemothorax when I was at UCLA cause I was more aggressive and I tend not to see that cause I'm going to do a venogram in two weeks anyway. Yeah. So I don't do anything for three days and depending, I don't do the venograms. My young partners do either Gabby does or whatever. Some of them do it on Xarelto Eliquis, some like Lovenox, but they stop for three days. They come back 10 days later and have their venogram to do that. And if they right. get dilated, we keep them on at least a month and look at the duplex to make sure the flow is good and abduction and adduction. If they're occluded, I've kept them on up to six months and those things will open up because your compression is gone. The one thing for sure you need never to do, never to do, because I'm dealing with a patient right now, is don't put a damn stent in there. No matter what you do, please don't put a stent in there. It never works. It always goes down. It hurts them. They're pissed off. And then I have to deal with the fact that they got a stent in there and I can't fix it. The latest one I did had residual rib, had a stent in there. She's hypercoagulable. I mean, it, it's a mess and she's 32 years old. So never put a stent in thoracic venous uh, occlusion. They will get collaterals. They'll be happy without it, but never. Plus it's expensive. You're costing me money. Don't put a stent in. Just put them on an anticoagulation. They'll get collaterals to make that happen. But I think it, it's, as you follow them, many of them will be happy, even if they're occluded, the two or three or 4% with the major collaterals that will form but never put yeah. a stent in. I wonder if you might comment there. There are two uh, well-known vascular surgeons. Kai Johansson worked uh, in Seattle for many years uh, with, in doing uh, thoracic outlet. And Robbie Thompson was an uh, intern when I was a chief resident at the Brigham, is quite well-known at uh, Wash U. Robbie's taken a very aggressive approach to venous reconstruction, quite often using deep, in, deep vein with AV fistulas, uh, intimectomies and, and a variety of direct vascular reconstructions. Kai's basically said almost nobody with uh, venous thoracic outlet needs anything done. How do you, how do we reconcile that? Do you think you have kind of an intermediate approach? Yeah. Well, I've told Kai this, I saw a lot of his patients, you know, okay. so they don't go back to him. So that's the wrong answer. And I love Kai, but that's the wrong answer. You'll get away with it. Uh, but most times you'll lose them to somebody else. Okay. I just reviewed Rob's whole series. I actually was asked to review it and it's a great series. It's very aggressive, high, higher incidence of complications, a yeah. lot of interoperative reconstruction, but he actually has classified them into 80% of them. He has limited the uh, intervention and, and what he does. He doesn't do an on the table venogram. He doesn't do it afterwards, but he actually has looked at their symptoms pre-op and classifies the bigger operations to those that he thinks has higher risk. And, and in my review, he doesn't do it the way I do it, but my God, he does it the same way all the time. So you're yeah. going to get really good results with that. Uh, and he does classify the ones that he does the major reconstruction um, to the high risk, uh, high uh, 
thrombosis rate, um, those that have long occlusions. His big thing is if you've got a big long occlusion, he's going to be really aggressive with you. And and I frankly don't have that philosophy, right. but I think he does categorize them in that piece. The key though is he does a great rib resection. And there's actually some questions in the chat that you have to look at the posterior rib and, and you need to get behind that nerve. No matter how you do this, you need yeah. to make sure you take out enough rib that you, when you look at the nerve, you don't see rib. And then you'll know you've got enough to make that happen, whether it's a second incision, which Rob uses quite right. frequently. Our Dr. Geary does a great job with his infracolicure, with his retraction. He got great rib resection with his approach. And, and therefore, it's it, it amazing. It, both approaches at the same institution ended up with really good results. A little different patient presentation, but right. the bottom line, they all did well. Julie, the last thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, which is really deep to my heart, is the, how I do it. That is, how do you train people? We have, you know, uh, Greg Pearl does 300 first ribs a year here, but nobody learns how to do it because he does it through a little keyhole incision that no one can see. And the transaxillary incision, in my experience, has been a pain in the butt, that it's hard to get two heads in that hole and really see this anatomy. And I agree with you, it, whatever the window that you're looking at takes a lot of repetition so you really get familiar with this anatomy because you start looking at it from different directions and you can get lost very quickly. And you're, as you said, you're trying to find that T1 nerve root to really assure complete decompression. So how do you train people? Well, you can ask Dr. Velasquez because I've trained her to do it. But and, and, and the SVS should take the video that I submitted today to show you how you train somebody to do this. That's exactly it. How you teach and train and how you get everybody in the room to understand. So make sure you take that video and put it on the program please, to make that happen. Um, but the key to this is the retractor. So Herb Mackletter created this amazing retractor in his garage years ago, which is a big tray that lifts the arm up. And with a lot of retractor, I can't see it at the same time Gabby sees it or the fellow sees it, but we go back and forth and we take our time. We identify the subclavian vein. We make sure we know where that is because then you're in the right spot. You make sure you see the anterior scaling muscle, then the artery and nerve. We take our time to get underneath that rib to make that happen. And by the time you get ready to cut it, everybody's seen the space. So I think I teach it really well, but Gabby can let you know, Misty can let you know, Mimi can let you know to make that happen. But the key is taking a little bit of time, making sure everybody sees it. And it is that retraction, pulling that arm way up. Yeah. I think that incision, John, is really big. You can yeah. see all sorts of stuff there to make it happen. But I guess it's a familiarity too. So if you see something abnormal, you know where you are, know where you're not. And, and the last yeah. thing before Gabby talks is I, I had a case that I needed to do, but I, I needed to leave because my husband was having surgery. I left Gabby with the toughest case in the whole world, <laughs> her and the fellow, the biggest guy you ever saw. And uh, off you went to make it happen. But so Dr. Velasquez, why don't you say a few words about how do you teach this operation? Right. So uh, I think that, again, we were just like grateful that you came to teach us that as well. And, and Dr. Goldman is here, too, and he can attest to that as well. Um, yeah, I think it's very much about the taking turns. Uh, that, that's how I can tell you that I definitely learned how to do it. Uh, I think the retractor is a major, major, major changer there. You can see everything. You think you want, but once that arm is up, 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 you definitely see it just amazing as to you know how much clearer things become and the more you do like she said you know we stop every time we stop every time and we'll we look at it every time before we are going to transect the rib before before we're transecting the um the interior scaling we identify the nerve and, and and all that and she was always being very adamant about making sure that we get all of the rib like there's we even you know at the end we're trying yeah. to make make sure that we're getting out with the roger at the end to make sure we're getting behind it and all that. So I think that has been really helpful. And that's what I personally use to teach our fellows as well. I'm sure Dr. Goldman probably uses a, a similar approach. Uh, and, you know, if you have ever scrubbed with Dr. Fresh, like she's famous for doing this picture, right, of what she's seeing. And really for everyone that is in the operating room, it makes it so clear uh, as to like where the structures yeah. are, what are the important um, considerations. Julie, if somebody was referred to you with an asymptomatic occlusion by the time they got to you, would you take their first rib out? 
No, I had that happen. You know, how can you make someone with no symptoms better, right? It, you can't, you just can screw them up, right, to do it. So if they have no symptoms and it's occluded, I think the biggest thing I've seen recently is I've had three McClary's in the last year, which mm -hmm. we've written up two that went years with people not knowing what's happening. And that you can mm -hmm. diagnose by your duplex scan. One was one of our physicians we just operated on. So I think that's the one that you need to listen to their symptoms. But if it's occluded and they have no symptoms, he can't make that better. And if anything, you could make them worse. So mm -hmm. I won't make anybody who has no symptoms better. Uh, I think you just say it's occluded. Make sure they aren't hypercoagulable. Make sure that the they're all right. The likelihood of having bilateral venous is only about 10%. So they're not going to have it. Uh, that being said, I just saw a patient this week. He thought he did the other side, but he just has neurogenic on the other side. It's a rare thing to occlude both. Well, thank you for uh, joining us, Julie. Really, it's a pleasure and an honor for all of us. Misty? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Such great discussion tonight. Two really good papers, a lot of discussion. I'm super grateful to Dr. Um, to Dr. Dua and to Dr. Freischlag for being here to discuss those papers. I think that adds to it. We will be back in February, February 15th, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll be posting all the dates through June on the um, SVSN uh, website so that you can have access to those. So we'll see you in February. Have a great night. Yeah, great job, Lydia. She's a medical student. We got to applaud her to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.